We're ready. I think we can uh, begin. So good morning, everyone. So it's 8 o'clock a.m. So let's um, begin this uh, webinar. So just to give um, an introduction to some of you who might not be familiar with our organization. So this webinar is being conducted through the initiative of the Philippine American Academy of Science and Engineering. So it's an organization made up of um, Filipino uh, scientists and engineers, both based in the Philippines, abroad, um, and in the U.S., uh, particularly in the U.S. So we had our first webinar last week. We had uh, Dr. Joma Rabahante of uh, UPLB. And this is our second webinar. And we intend to have uh, weekly webinars. So for the second uh, webinar, we will be continuing with the topic on um, COVID-19. So it's a very uh, popular uh, topic these days. So to get... With us today is uh, Dr. Anna Serquinha. She completed her medical de degree at the University of the Philippines College of Medicine. She earned her PhD in Biomedical Sciences at the University of Massachusetts Me Medical School studying HIV-1 host pathogen in interactions. She went on to do her postdoctoral fellowship at the National Cancer Institute, NIH in Bethesda, working on host targets of viral microRNAs. More recently, she has been promoted to staff scientist at NCI, and she continues to work on cancer-causing viruses, both in basic and translational research. Anna is a newly elected member of the Philippine American Academy of Science and Engineering and currently serves as our treasurer and as a member of the board of directors. Um, I forgot to mention for our participant, please feel free to uh, write in any of your questions and then we'll entertain all of the questions at the end of um, Anna's talk. So without further ado, so let's have Dr. Anna Serquinha with her talk, SARS-CoV-2, Knowns and Unknowns in this COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, thank Anna. You. Thank you, Dr. Avisa, for that um, kind welcome. And thank you to Paase for uh, the opportunity to give this talk today. So I am a virologist at the NCI, and I've always joked that viruses will rule the world. And unfortunately, we are in a situation that proves that true. Um, so just a disclaimer. So the goals of this webinar is to try to answer these questions that are probably topmost in our minds right now. And this is, why is this COVID-19 pandemic so difficult to contain? what makes this virus different and what can we do about it? And at the end, I will touch on some questions that I think needs further research um, so that we can answer them. Uh, I wanted to start with this comparison of um, the respiratory viral infections. And you have probably heard from news reports that SARS-CoV-2 is the third coronavirus in the last two decades to emerge as a virus that causes an epidemic and now a pandemic. And I wanted uh, you to pay attention to the r naught uh, and comparison of COV-2 and the other coronaviruses. So r naught is what they use to measure the contagiousness of pathogens. And as what you can see, it's actually, COV-2 is actually very similar to SARS. Um, also the case fatality rate, um, which is the number of the percentage of people who die in the population that become sick of this virus is actually should be lower compared to SARS and MERS. But in reality, we think that this is not the case. And we will try to answer that question. Why, why is that so? I also wanted to point out that there are four other coronaviruses that are endemic to humans, and these manifest as the common cold. So viruses are obligate intracellular parasites, meaning they need a host to survive and to propagate themselves. And so here is the life cycle of uh, SARS-CoV-2, which is a single strand RNA virus, a positive sense RNA virus. And what we know so far is they have identified a putative receptor, which is ACE2 or angiotensin 1 converting enzyme. And also um, it needs this protease called TMPRSS2 or transmembrane serine protease 2 um, to help 
the S protein fuse and so that the virus can enter. And once it enters, um, since it's a positive sense RNA virus, it can immediately translate. Um, it's ready to go and hijack the cell. And this results in the translation of viral polymerase and uh, it proceeds with RNA replication. It's making copies of itself. And I just wanted to note that um, for those who, of you who are concerned about mutations of this virus, this virus actually has an exonuclease for proofreading. So the mutations are not as high as you would expect. And so during RNA replication and then transcription, so the virus is now making messages to uh, direct the um, production of proteins, which the virus will then use to make new viruses or nascent variants. So these are then assembled and then are released into the environment. So this event is called um, viral shedding. You are then seeing here infectious viral particles that can infect either another cell or another host. Um, so the COV-2 has been shown to infect these types of cells shown on the left of the slide, the type 1 and type 2 pneumocytes in the, in the lungs and also alveolar macrophages. And it can also infect um, mucous cells in the nasal cavity. And it is the death of the type two pneumocytes during COVID-19 illness that results in the loss of air ex exchange and um, fluid leakage into the lungs. And at this point, the patient will need a ventilator. So for the purposes of this talk, I'm gonna use URT1 to mean the upper respiratory tract and this will mean the throat and the nasopharynx and LRT to mean lower respiratory tract or the lungs. So the natural history of um, COVID-19 is um, you see the symptoms one to two weeks after your exposure from someone who is also COVID positive. And the illness duration is known to be two weeks for mild cases and about three to six weeks for severe cases. And what I want to do right now is to look at what is the viral load kinetics, meaning these are measures of viral replication, how fast the virus is copying and making copies of itself, and also viral shedding, how fast it's being um, shed into the environment to infect others. So this is a busy slide, but I think it's an important paper to tackle. It was recently accepted in Nature, and what you're seeing is the um, manuscript form. That's why it still has the watermark. But what it's showing is a survey of patients, of nine patients, so one panel per patient. And I want you to look at the yellow lines, and this would represent the nasopharyngeal swabs or URT swabs. And what you can appreciate is the yellow lines over time, which is the, y, uh, the X axis, and then the Y axis would be the viral RNA copies. So the yellow lines over time very quickly disappears actually. So as early as one week, the yellow lines go down below the limit of detection, which is the dotted line that you see. Now, looking at the orange lines, which, re which represents the sputum samples, you can see that it stays elevated longer, longer than one week in some patients. And this means that you can detect viral RNA from the sputum um, much longer than the nasopharyngeal swab. Now shifting to the gray lines, which represents the stool, this is variable depending on the patient. Uh, what I want to note though is despite um, detection of RNA in these samples, the, this group also tried to grow infectious, uh, isolate the infectious particles and grow the virus. And what they found is that in stool, even though you can isolate RNA, they were not able to um, isolate infectious virus. So um, as a recap for mild illness, mild COVID-19, uh, using RT-PCR as an assay, all swabs were positive from day one to day five, but after day five, the detection rate drops to 40%, and the last positive swab is at day 28. And also, um, none of the urine and serum samples were positive for viral RNA, so that means these are not good samples um, for diagnostic purposes. Again, I mentioned isolation of infectious virus, so can we actually grow the virus on cells? And 
what they saw was that no virus was isolated after the first week. And this is important, majority of patients are beyond the shedding peak in the URT at the time of the first testing. So that means the shedding peak might actually be before they become symptomatic. So the good news is that seroconversion happens. 50% uh, of patients seroconvert at day seven, and then all of them seroconvert by the end of two weeks. And um, the titer did not correlate with the clinical course. And the neutralizing antibodies actually cross-react with the four endemic coronaviruses that I mentioned. Okay, what about moderate illness? Um, so this is just one patient tracking the viral RNA load. And the blue line would be um, the blue line would be the URT specimen, and you can see that for this moderately ill patient, the URT specimen is positive for longer than one week, closer to two weeks. And then the LRT specimen is actually higher than the URT um, specimen. So the viral RNA load coming from the lungs is higher. And this patient actually needed oxygen support. Unfortunately for this study, they were not able to do the isolation of infectious virus from the specimen. Okay, sorry. So viral shedding, again, um, this means that um, the patient is spreading the virus because the particles um, can still infect other cells or other people. And for mild and moderate um, cases, this seems to be, the viral shedding seems to be around seven to 12 days with day seven um, for mild cases. And the severe cases, uh, apparently, they, um, they are uh, shedding beyond two weeks. Okay, what about uh, the comparison between COV-2 and the first SARS? Um, what we are seeing is that the peak of the viral RNA load happens before day five, while in SARS from 2003, it happened after the first week. So basically for SARS, you have a symptomatic patient and then they, they start shedding much later compared to the first diagnosis. But in SARS-CoV-2, they shed a lot first and then they become symptomatic. And then if you look at the copy number, there's much more copies being made by COV-2 compared to the first SARS, at least logs of difference. And for sites of replication, COV-2 actually has two sites of replication, the throat and the lung, while the SARS is, first SARS is known to um, only replicate in the lungs. Okay, let's move on to asymptomatic and presymptomatic viral shedding. So unfortunately, um, we don't know the true asymptomatic infection rate because there is no effort as of yet to do surveillance in the general population. Um, but for pre-symptomatic, now we know that um, we can spread the virus two to eight days before onset of symptoms. And here is an example. So this is um, surveillance data from Singapore. Uh, so this cluster F, so we have the F1 patient who was exposed on February 27 in a singing class on February 27, where she was exposed to a patient with conferred, confirmed COVID. And then she attended a church service on March 1, where she likely infected F2 and F3, who sat one row behind her, and they probably sang together. And then F1 developed symptoms on March 3, F2 also developed symptoms on March 3, and F3 developed symptoms on March 5. So it's scary, but this is in support of social distancing at this time. Okay, now let's shift gears and look at COVID-19 in children. Um, for the USA population, children make up about one-fifth of the population, but for COVID positive cases between February 12 and February 2, children make up less than 2% of COVID cases and they are reported to have milder symptoms, need less hospitalization, 
and the exception would be infants and children with underlying conditions. And so why is that? At the moment, we don't know. And however, there are some hypotheses um, circulating such as maybe recent immunizations of children can protect against COVID, or maybe if you have a five-year-old or a seven-year-old in the household, you know that they are always getting sick of the colds. So maybe a recent infection with coronavirus is causing colds have a protective effect. At the moment, we actually don't know the answer to this and we need people to study this. Okay, so why is COVID-19 so deadly in some patients? And for this, we have to look at the host response. And I wanted to point your attention towards this preprint from the Tinover lab in Mount Sinai wherein they looked at um, the transcriptome of human cells. So A549 is um, long adenocarcinoma cells, cell line, and then they also did infections on um, this NHBE. So primary cells from bronchial epithelium from a 79 year old female. And so what they did was they infected the cells with um, either RSV, influenza virus, or SARS-CoV-2. And then they sent those samples for RNA sequencing. So looking at gene signatures, gene expression signatures, trying to see if there's any similarities or differences. And what you can see from this Venn diagram is that the one with the largest gene expression signature is RSV. And SARS-CoV-2 actually shares 79 of those gene expression changes. So what host genes are going up or going down with the infection. And SARS-CoV-2 actually does not share a lot of similarities with the influenza virus. And this means that for these three illnesses, it's very different. The gene expression changes in the host is very different. So that's the in, vi in vitro experiment. So what about in, vi in vivo? So for this, they tested it in um, ferrets and harvested um, cells from the trachea. And what we are looking at is called a volcano plot, which is showing what are the genes that are going up. So those are dots that are on the right side of the volcano plot, the red dots. And then what genes are going what genes are going down with the infection? And that those are the dots on the left side, and each dot is one gene. And what you can appreciate in this um, influenza infected cells from this animal is that a lot of genes that are for inflammation are going up with influenza virus. Now, what about COV-2. This is what it looks like, and it looks like nothing is happening. And, you know, maybe one or two dots, that's it. And this is alarming when I saw it because it means that the immune response to the COV-2 virus is muted. And this includes the absence of the induction of type 1 and type 3 interferons. And we will get back to this interferons in the next slide. What I wanted to point out was um, what this group saw is induction of um, genes for cytokines, um, endothelin-1, and TNF-SF15. So endothelin-1 has been shown to be increased in children with asthma and also increased by cigarette smoking. So this might be a good candidate to study in terms of, yeah, maybe this is the one that's causing damage in the lungs of patients with COV-2. So going back to the interferons, what are interferons? So interferons are um, produced by the cells as a 911 call. So they activate signaling cascades to mount an antiviral response. So basically the cell is recognizing there's a virus. It calls 911 and it activates all the defenses against the virus. But unfortunately, in response to COV-2, this is not happening. There is no 911 happening during the infection with COV-2. So experimental therapies, I'm not really gonna talk into this deeply. I think it should be a separate um, webinar, 
But I will just want to note that for hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, I know there's anecdotes of efficacy, like you read some report in a newspaper. But for the trials, there's actually been mixed results in small trials. So one trial said, yes, it works. Another trial came out, it said it didn't work, both from France. And what we really need is uh, large randomized control trials for uh, efficacy to see if it really works. So remdesivir uh, from Gilead, it has promising preclinical data. For those who are interested, I can um, point you towards the papers from the Barrick Lab and the Denison Lab, and it really looks promising. This was being developed way before COVID-19 happened. It was actually found to be effective against SARS and MERS. Um, and then I just wanted to touch upon um, the convalescent plasma. Uh, so um, these are from patients who have developed immunity after the illness. And this is actually proof. There's some good news, right? The preliminary data on convalescent plasma is good. And I think this is proof that at least some of us can develop some kind of immunity against the virus. And so I'm pointing you towards the website, clinicaltrials.gov, um, to see um, if you want to check what clinical trials are ongoing for all these um, therapies, which I have not listed here, and also the WHO solidarity trial. Okay, so for viral vaccine development, yes, there's efforts to do this. There's actually different platforms to do this. And just to mention two, one is Novo, Novavax, which is based out of um, Gaithersburg, Maryland, started, uh, will start phase one in mid-May after promising results with animal um, experiments. And also Moderna uh, has a collaboration with NIAID from NIH, and they have started uh, recruitment in March for phase one. Okay, so why is SARS-CoV-2 difficult to contain? And I think the answer to this is it's highly transmissible and it replicates very efficiently. Um, and the clues to this are, as what I've pointed out, there's efficient viral replication in the throat and we see 1,000 times more um, viral copies, RNA copies than SARS-CoV. And also there's replication happening in the lungs. And then these are then expelled via droplets through sneezing, coughing, singing, talking, and then there's also evidence now that it might be going airborne. And the peak of the shedding is prior to day five, which includes a pre-symptomatic phase wherein the, the patients are already infecting other people. Um, another issue is the persistence of viral particles in the air and in its surfaces. There's a report um, that was showing that Vir the half-life of virus particles in the air is actually three hours. So what I mean by half-life is after three hours, the virus is 50% less infectious. And then at six hours, it's, it becomes, it goes down to 25. And then another three hours, it goes down to 12.5. So it will take like 24 hours before the virus is actually non-infectious in the air in that room. Okay, so there's also um, evidence that there's an insertion in the cleavage site, but there's no proof of this, but they're hypothesizing this causes a uh, faster entry of the virus into the cell. And then of course, no or weak response, interferon response to the virus, and the host is unable to clear the virus. So what are the implications of this? I think it means that for diagnostic testing, we have to test within the first three days of symptoms, not one week you know, two weeks after, no, should be earlier than that. And then of course, PPE for everyone caring for COVID positive patients and also ask patients to wear masks to minimize the spread of viral particles. And then after discharge, patients should need to continue to self-isolate, especially for those moder moderately ill patients um, who continue to shed the virus beyond one week. And of course, this has um, implications for disinfection of hospitals and nursing facilities. Um, and all these places. And I think at this point, we should just assume that everyone is COVID positive, but asymptomatic, and just wear a mask and practice social, continue to practice social distancing. So there's so many questions still. Um, why do children have milder COVID-19? I think endothelin-1 gene expression in children should be investigated. What conditions or comorbidities um, predispose the host to a weak interferon response? 
We don't know that. As I mentioned, from the cells, studies in the cells, that was in a 79-year-old female. We should also do this in you know, primary cells from like a 20-year-old, 40-year-old, uh, and see uh, what is their ability to mount an antiviral response. And what factors lead to COVID-19 complications? So what, why, why does it lead to the inability to clear the virus? And is it inflammation? Is inflammation playing a role? And what is the intermediate host? Can we vaccinate them? So for MERS, what they ended up doing was vaccinating the camels to mitigate the transmission to humans. And of course, we need animal models to study this. Ferrets seem, ferrets seem to be a good model for it. How about a mouse model? And then how can we end this pandemic? How, how can we break the transmission chain? So I'm going to point you towards Dr. Rabahanta's webinar from last week. It's been recorded and the slides are available uh, for you to look at. And um, so what can we do? More diagnostic testing, support the frontliners, and accelerate the pace of research, which is happening right now. And I think each one of us should think about how we can pivot each each one's research and expertise and try to help towards um, this SARS-CoV-2, understanding SARS-CoV-2. And if you can, if there's one near you, maybe volunteer to become a study participant. And lastly, we need access, open access to reliable, reproducible, and validated data. So at this point, I will end my talk. And just for a pop quiz, I want to um, check and see whether you can uh, determine for this person who is holding a pipette doing an experiment. If this was a COVID, SARS-CoV-2 experiment, what do you think is she doing wrong at this moment with her PPE? So I'll give you maybe five seconds. And okay, so if she is indeed doing SARS-CoV-2 experiments, she should really change her mask she should not be opening her petri dish outside the culture hood and she should pay attention to her gloves and maybe tape her gloves to her lab gown. And that's it. That's the end of my presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Anna. You've really raised so many questions there and um, I think there's so much to be discussed. Um, so we have a lot of time for Q&A. Right. So I hope our participants would also participate and don't be shy in uh, writing down any of your questions. So Anna can see those questions um, as well as I can, I think everybody can see the questions. Okay, maybe we can um, begin with uh, the earlier questions while you were presenting. So earlier on, you had a slide um, uh, looking at the, the I think, the, the, the tests, whether they're positive or negative mm -hmm. with respect to time. So and Anjali is, um, Angie is trying to ask if that's with or without treatment. So for these patients, they were mildly ill. I want to say that they were not treated. Okay. Um, for minimal intervention, just supportive care. Okay, okay. So how do you think um, a treatment would influence those kinds of, yeah, the, the, those graphs? So if a treatment is effective, I'm hoping that, of course, you will see a drop in, one, the viral RNA copies earlier. And then two, we won't be able to isolate infectious virus particles I see. from sputum or swab anymore. So for this data, it was day seven, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe earlier than that, you know, if the treatment is truly effective, then that should shorten the course and help the patient recover faster. Okay, the next question is from Gis Bilardo. So does it mean that you can be tested negative when you make use of swabs, but you can actually still be positive? I think the answer is yes, based on um, what people are now publishing. It depends on when you were tested relative to when your symptoms started. So if you're tested like maybe day 10 of your illness, maybe it's already gone, especially if it's mild and you're able to clear it. Okay, 
Um, we have another question from Homer. Is it known if there is differential expression of ACE2 between the young and adult? Okay, um, since some of our audience might not be in, this, in the medical field, maybe you can um, explain to us more what's ACE2 about. And... So the ACE2 is the putative receptor for um, the virus. So it's basically a handshake between the virus and the host cell. Mm -hmm. If it fits, if the spike of the virus fits the receptor, then the virus is allowed to enter the cell. So I have not seen any studies looking at differential expression. And that's definitely one of the things I think that need to be answered. And maybe if ACE2 expression is low in children, maybe the virus is not really able to enter um, their lung cells. I see. So yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, actually, um, one of our participants, Joel, um, did uh, answer that question, but he had a follow-up question. So he wonders if nasal or oral delivery of a vaccine would be best. Nasal or oral? I don't know. I actually don't know the answer to that question. I would guess that nasal, just because of the replication sites, but I'm mm -hmm. just speculating. Mm -hmm. But what about the initial um, developments that they're doing now, um, initial research on vaccines? So uh, how is the progress in that? And um, would you know what direction they're going? So I don't know about the delivery system. I just know that they are looking at nanoparticles for delivery. So I'm guessing maybe that some of them might be looking at this nasal delivery. But um, no, I don't know any particulars about um, the vaccine um, okay. delivery platform or uh, the delivery of it. Okay, so thank you. So one from Aldous de Leon, what is the viral course of recovered patients? Asymptomatic carriers or full immunity? Oh, good point. Um, I don't think I've seen any studies looking at the course of recovered patients. Um, just based on um, what has been reported, it looks like um, as they're recovering, some of them might still be shedding virus. So we have to be careful, especially for those who have like um, moderate to severe illness. But for the mild ones, I think it, it's very clear that you know, once they recover, they develop immunity and they're fine. Yeah, but for the moderate and severe, that I think needs to be done. Can you comment on some of the news reports saying that some who have initially been tested, who have been cleared of the, of this, um, of COVID, uh, eventually become positive again? Yeah, so the test that is being done is called the RT-PCR, right? And that actually detects um, RNA bits of the virus. And what you saw, remember that very busy slide, it actually goes up and down during okay. the very end of um, the course. And just because it goes down and then it goes up again, it doesn't mean that the infection is coming back. It just means that Maybe the body is still, you know, clearing out, you know, the debris from the virus that is, you know, it's probably already dead. So the gold standard would be if you have a patient like that, it would be good, like, to find out, can we still isolate live virus from them? Mm -hmm. Then, you know, they're still infectious. But I know it's very tedious, very time consuming. We can't do that for all the patients that are admitted. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, if, if you notice the pattern there is, it goes up and down at the very end and that might just be it it's just like you know it went negative and then the next test was okay. positive okay we have a question from vince daria so actually it's a i think it's related to one of our earlier questions so maybe you can expound a bit again on the function of ace2 receptor the function of sorry say that again the ace2, ACE2. receptor yeah yeah i'm sorry i cannot comment on that <laughs> <laughs> Aside from the fact that I know it's the putative receptor. I know in hypertension it plays a role, but I think people who are, like maybe Tony Vic, can you chime in on that? Okay, let me see. Where is uh, Tony? Is Tony around? Antonio, he's here. Antonio. Okay, hold on. Okay, let us unmute Antonio. And Antonio, maybe you can give us um, your insights on this. 
Uh, I can't you... seem to do the unmute. Oh, that's not good. Uh, can you try it from your end, Anna? Unmute audio. Yeah, I don't know why it's not doing that. I'm so sorry. Hmm. No, I'm sorry, I can't unmute him. Okay, maybe we'll go through the comments later on and maybe Tony will have a feedback yes, <laughs> in our you, comments sorry, section. Tony, but could you just type it in? All right, so let's proceed. Um, we have one from Gis Bellardo again. Diagnostic testing within uh, the first three days of symptoms. What are the possible implications of this for the Philippines, considering that there are very limited test kits and testing centers? Hmm. Yeah, the logistics of this pandemic is very hard. Um, we need to be able to find a way to scale up. Um, I've heard that there are efforts to shift towards the maybe the CEFI um, testing kit, and that can be done quickly. And I heard that DOH ordered a lot of these kits. And there should be like 300 plus machines that DOH has. So we definitely have to work on the logistics of the testing because if you can't test, you know, how are you going to get a handle of um, this pandemic? Okay, one from Camela. So thank you so much for that informative talk. Could you comment on Wolfell et al's findings that there's independent replication of SARS-CoV-2 in the throat and in the lungs? Yes, I thought that was very interesting that there's actually two sites of replication. And I think it just means that, you know, SARS-CoV-2 is probably infecting more cell types than we think. Um, so that needs to be confirmed. I'm just speculating at this point, but I thought that was very interesting that they were able to show two replication sites and maybe that's why the load, the viral load is just very high. Okay, so we had um, a response from Homer about the ACE2 receptor saying that the ACE2 receptor is for SARS-CoV, ACE2 is the receptor for SARS-CoV-2. Um, okay, another question from Vince. So other than being a receptor of COVID-19, if we block that receptor, what are the side effects in terms of cellular function? So I'm sorry, I cannot comment on that. I know that there are some drugs that are ACE inhibitors and it's usually used for hypertensives, mm -hmm. but for other cell functions of ACE2, I'm sorry, it's, I cannot answer it. Okay, one comment from uh, Mary Chris. Um, can these, together with our previous webinar of um, Dr. Rabahante, be converted into useful education for government leaders, especially for our IATF, so that, with, so that they can better understand and make decisions that are more science-based? I would love for that to happen. That's why we're doing this. Um, yes, but how is, how is the situation there in the U.S.? Like, it's very political, unfortunately. Um, I'm so thankful that we have Tony Fauci, who is the head of NIAID, and he's on the task force as, as well. So he is very science-based at least, but there are other forces, political forces at work, unfortunately. Who are, yeah, so it's, yes, forces it's really that are more, <laughs> yes, you know, forces that are more concerned about the economy. Mm -hmm. Let's leave it at that. Okay, one question from Jerome Lazaga. Uh, granting that RNA load is highest in the first five days, how effective are asymptomatic spreaders compared this, to the symptomatic ones? So that one, we don't know. We don't know how many people, first of all, are asymptomatic. But I am guessing that they are asymptomatic because they have a way to maybe clear the virus I'm just speculating here. I have no evidence for this. This is just my hypothesis. So maybe they are not, if they can uh, clear the virus faster or they can control the virus, then maybe they are not as bad spreaders as say someone who is moderately ill. But I have no evidence for that. 
Okay, but how is it like for other types of infections? Like maybe the previous um, coronavirus. So for coronavirus, I don't think... So the thing about the first SARS, the person becomes symptomatic first. Okay. And then about five days into their illness, then they become infectious. Like three, five days, you know, and then they start, you know, having this peak of the viral load. So that's why it's easy to quarantine them. So once they become symptomatic, ah, they I have see. fever, you know, and then, oh, they came from a place or there's contact, you know, tracing done. They can easily quarantine these patients and prevent the spread. That is the difference between the SARS now and the SARS before is it's so hard to identify who is, first of all, how can we identify them when we don't have enough tests? By the time we test them, maybe they they already have low RNA, viral RNA load, right? And then if they cannot be tested, we cannot isolate them, then maybe they just continue yeah. to spread. To infect, okay. Yeah. All right. So I think we have a response from Homer on the question about ACE2. So he said that it is involved in the renin angiotensin system, which is important in the cardiovascular related, related function. Vasoconstriction and um, vasodilation. Okay, and now we have um, a comment from Tony. Okay, so Krista, how will we know that the infection will confer lasting immunity? Okay, there has been an unpublished study about macaques being reinfected with a virus and displaying no symptoms. Is there a better way to test immunity? I think the only way to test immunity would be to see, you know, IgG. Do we, do we get the IgG, right? And then, yeah, I, I don't really know of any other way to retest mm -hmm. aside from like looking at your antibodies, right? And then does it confer lasting immunity? So the, the thing that comes to mind is at least there's cross-reactivity among the um, coronaviruses. So there seems to be a protective effect. Mm -hmm. And if there's no lasting immunity, well, that means if we do vaccinate, we will have to keep boosting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, one from Arsenio. Uh, for mask use, will an N95 mask be enough protection for aerosolizing procedures such as a tracheostomy in a COVID-positive person um, needing such a procedure? I would recommend also a face shield. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just because N95 is so... Like you really have to fit it properly, right? And um, I think I read somewhere that what helps among um, the frontliners is if you do a buddy system, that you have a buddy and you will have your buddy put on their PPE and then that yeah. buddy will help you put on your PPE to make sure that you have it on correctly. Oh, okay. Yeah. So one from Francis Gordovis, is there evidence for HLA loxet Loxide to vary with immune response, prognosis, etc. Interesting question. Francis, you should do that research. That's your project <laughs> when you go back to the Philippines. <laughs> okay. Okay. From, one from Jessica Asuncion. NAST is interested to study the glycosylation of spike proteins from COVID-2 virus and vaccines. Do you have an access to the lab who is investigating these proteins? Glycosylation. Um, there is actually an ongoing, um, there's a listserv at NIH and people can openly like collaborate there, find collaborators. So I'm sorry, which institute did you say you were? And I, uh, hmm, Jessica Asunshon. Uh, hold on. Um, she's from Mariano Marcos State University. Okay. Um, we... What is the best way? Could you send me an email? I'm going to flash my thing yes. again. Could you send me an email? And let's see if we can get you connected with the people who are doing that research. Great. Okay, so we have a comment from Joel Chua. So non-COVID coronavirus immunity only lasts for less than one year. Um, 
So why do we expect that it can be longer for SARS-CoV-2? Could this be because of timing of the response? I'm sorry. Yeah, what, why do we expect that it, it to be longer than SARS-CoV-2? I would expect that it's probably similar, right? I don't know. Mm -hmm. but that means maybe, you're right, maybe we have to keep boosting. If we yeah. do find a vaccine. Just like the flu shots. <laughs> like flu shots. Yeah. Okay, um, a question from Michael Villarde. Based on the volcano plot, several inflammatory genes were muted in SARS-CoV-2, but it has changed that no genes at all have significantly high p-value or fold change with SARS-CoV-2. Could this be because of the timing of the response? Um, they actually, I think, I'm trying to remember how long they um, tested the ferrets. But they went, I think they went pretty long on it. So I think it's not the timing. It might just be like very muted response. You, you could test that too, right? Like if you go back to cells and maybe see if you have the infection longer, would there be more of a response at longer time points? I, I don't think they did a time course. Yeah, that's a good point. So yeah, they didn't do a time course. So another one from Kamala Ang, is it, is it possible that children are protected from severe COVID-19 disease because the nonspecific effects of BCG vaccination reduce the risk of developing severe pneumonia after the COVID infection? Yes, that, I saw that hypothesis. Someone has to test that, like make a survey or some kind of study. Yes. If somebody could answer that question, that would be great. Okay, can you comment on temperature sensitivity of the virus? So everyone is hoping that warm, warmer conditions will help decrease the viral course in the environment. So this is from Aldous. So Aldous, the thing about the temperature is, if it's really temperature sensitive, I was thinking that maybe in countries that have hotter climates, it's not going to be as much of a problem. I don't know. It seems like all the countries are affected. So I'm not sure if for, for us, it's springtime right now. It's going to be summer in a couple of months. I don't know if it's going to go away by summertime, the way flu viruses do. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Okay, so we'll just have to wait and see. Yeah. <laughs> but have there been studies that have tried to test this one? Um, sensitivity of the virus? Yes, yes. There, I'm trying to remember who it was. It doesn't come to mind at the moment. Okay. Yeah, maybe later. <laughs> okay, so we have one question from Christina, okay, Amanda. Um, so we, we talked about um, some recovered patients testing positive again. Um, is there a, um, would you know how long it takes between those tests for a recovered patient to actually test positive again? So the thing about recovery is you you can be testing using the RT-PCR, right? You can be testing and just be detecting bits of the RNA, um, mm -hmm. bits of the virus, so the RNA genome, for instance, but it doesn't mean that the virus is there. Um, in terms of when should you test again, I think for that Nature paper, they were doing like maybe every other day, so maybe after two, after two days, we test again. Because at the very end, it becomes very noisy, right? It's, there's a little bit up and then a down. But this one thing too that I noticed is um, it is an RT-PCR. So there is a little bit of like, um, where do they set the baseline? And I saw that some groups are not very strict in their definition of negative. So mm -hmm. that's another thing too, is your platform, your diagnostic platform matters. Because it can be positive here, but if you test in a different platform, maybe it's negative. If it's like right there, you know, mm -hmm. parang it's almost negative, but not quite negative. That's why they call it positive, that kind of thing. Okay, then we have a com comment from Judy. So it's a great resource on nephjc.com regarding ACE2 and uh, COVID-19. So for those of you who are interested to read more about that, so maybe you can um, visit you, that visit that particular website. Okay. 
Um, a comment from Virginia. Um, I hope you have invited LGU executives and their medical representatives for firsthand and better understanding of the disease. Helpful for them. This will be helpful for them. What intervention to do in their respective localities? Um, can you comment on that? How is the scenario there? Um, so I think we have, from where I am, we have federal level, you know, we have the scientists and then the policymakers, and then we also have state level, you know, the health, uh, Department of Health, and then the governor. And I feel like at least where I am in Maryland and DC and Virginia, they are very proactive. So at least they know what's going on. They are updated by the um, experts around them. So I feel that at least maybe that's going well. However, on the federal level, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and I hope um, the same trend will happen here in the Philippines yes. as well. <laughs> okay, uh, question from Homer. On the same note as Michael Velarde's comment, what are your thoughts about the discrepancy between the ferret data and the data that IL-6 is a biomarker predictor of respiratory failure? So, IL-6 is a predictor of respiratory, re respiratory failure, but only because it induces inflammation. I think that's that. It's, it's a marker of um, some inflammation that is going on. And then if there's too much inflammation, then you, you go towards respiratory failure because if there's too much inflammation, the cells die. Um, for the COVID 2 I don't know what else they're inducing and what's happening. So the, the limitation about that particular study is it was only done in ferrets. And then for the human part, it was done on cells from a 79 year old woman. So elderly, right? Mm -hmm. I think what, what needs to be done is let's sample the other age groups and see if it's the same. And maybe do we see more immune response? Do we see more inflammation happening in the other age groups? Inflammation is good if it's controlled inflammation. If it's too much, it's also bad. And that can cause the respiratory failure you were talking about. Okay. Um, question from Dennis. What is your take on immunoassays, IgM, IgG detection? What would be its role if only 50% zero convert after one week? So about the assays for IgG, I don't know. It depends on what assay it is. For this particular study, they actually used immunofluorescence. So you know the protein is there, right? If you were doing an ELISA or something else, I don't know. Um, and then the other question was 50% zero convert, convert yeah. at one week. Yeah, it looks like recovery time just takes a little bit longer for others. Um, as to what contributes to this, we don't know at the moment. Okay, so a comment from Joel Chua. We still don't know the correlation of protection for this virus. Generally, neutralizing antibodies is the in vitro marker, but not always. Okay, um, um, question from Vince Daria. From a single cell perspective, how long does it take from entry of the COVID-19 replication to shedding? A couple of hours. I think it might be 10 hours, something like that. I see. Um, and, and what's the implication of this one, like? Hmm, I think it's very quick. Compared so, to others. Yes, like I study herpes viruses, right? So mm -hmm. they, they, they cause cancer. Mm -hmm. And they are pretty quiet viruses. And then this one is just like 10 hours. Okay, let's spit out new variants already. I see. Okay, another question from Orlad. Um, I might have missed it, but did they also check anti-inflammatory cytokine levels or gene expression, dynamics of both anti and pro-inflammatory cytokines in COVID-19 patients? Wonderful question. I was also interested in that. I'm thinking they're working on that right now. They did not look at the actual levels of the cytokines. They were only reporting the gene expression levels. Yes. Okay. 
One from Joel, uh, problem with studying SARS-CoV-2 in the lab is that you need uh, BSL-3. What does that mean? So BSL-3 is rather strict and it's there's only a couple of BSL-3 um, labs. That's That mm -hmm. might be a limitation unless you start converting. Um, so BSL is biosafety level and mm -hmm. My lab, for instance, we work in biosafety level two. Um, if you want uh, something that's stricter, there's a lot of like uh, positive pressure and all that stuff. There's, there's more mm -hmm. safeguards against having the virus spread inadver inadvertently in the lab setting. And then you have to wear more PPE. I see. Yeah. Okay, and, and, and like how long does it take to convert a lab, for example, to a BSL-3? I think they just need they need to get the machines that first of all it has to be like um, enclosed and you know secured entry and then they need to um, put in the proper um, the cell culture hoods that would meet the specifications and then have that have that lab be certified for BSL two so uh, BSL three so I don't know it might be like depending on the institute. But once they file like for um, accreditation, um, it doesn't take a long time. I I I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. But it's like um, a procedure that you know you have to mm -hmm. be certified. You have to have the proper equipment, um, the circulation of the air, and all that. And then mm -hmm. you have to be able to autoclave all your stuff inside the lab before it goes out. You need to be able to autoclave and sterilize them before it goes out the, the door. Okay, one question. Oh, sorry. Hmm? Okay. Uh, we have a question from Philip Filiante. Are PAPRs better than N95 respirators, especially for those who perform airway procedures? Oh, I I'm sorry. I cannot comment on that. I am not familiar with all the different flavors of PPE. But I will try to see if I can get you some resources. Okay, that's great. Um, we have a question from Monica. Um, this was also mentioned earlier, but maybe you can comment again on it. Uh, thoughts on the protection conferred by the previous BCG? Um, let's wait and see what the study looks like. Okay, a question from Dennis. In the volcano plot, how would you reconcile the muted inflammatory genes in SARS-CoV-2 with the observation that severe COVID-19 presents with a hyperinflammatory state or cytokine storm? Yes, so that was actually good observation. That was actually something that they need to address maybe with a different model yeah, so we don't know. We, we don't know why it's so different from people seeing, oh, how come these patients are undergoing a cytokine storm? And that, by the way, I think might be the reason why we're, some of the clinical trials are trying to, you know, block IL-6 like tocilizumab. Yeah, so I, I don't know. Maybe they're not looking at the right model at the moment. Okay, one from Marge Pena. Can you comment on the rapid test from Abbott? What is the basis of this test? From Abbott? No, I'm sorry. I haven't seen the specifications of that. Is this a five-minute test? I think it might be, right? Okay, no, I haven't seen the specification of that one. I know the Cepheid one is um, RT-PCR based still because it was talking about CT values. But no, I, I, I still have to look at that Abbott one. Okay, an answer from Joel for the question of Aldous. Virus is heat sensitive and can be killed by 80 degrees Celsius, but that does not mean hotter climates will reduce the transmission. No one knows right now. Okay, um, from Arsenio, there are a lot of um, Misting areas here in the Philippines for the contamination. Any comments about this? Is it effective or are we just exposing people to chemicals unnecessarily? Sorry, misting areas? 
Yeah, because now what they're doing is um, they try to do the contamination. So people like um, the, the government, local government units go around different areas trying to decontaminate. So they do misting. I'm not, I'm not really sure what kind of chemicals they have in, in, in there, but they're spraying it in um, the regions. Like they go to subdivisions or maybe near the malls. Yeah, I, I don't know what's in the mist. Um, yeah, I think they say it's uh, something to remove the virus. I'm not sure. <laughs> so, but um, is a similar procedure being done? Would you know if there's a similar procedure being done elsewhere? Okay. Not that I know of. Okay. Um, we have, okay, we have a question from Giselle. Does it infect RBC or interact with HB? Um, I don't think there's any reports of it in, uh, infecting RBC, red blood cells. Okay, hold on. Uh, okay, there's a comment from Homer. It's cheaper to use BSL-3 certified isolators installed in a BSL-2 facility. Ah. That's and then there's a comment from Elmer Mojica. So the Abbott um, tests can be found in www.abbott.com slash corp newsroom slash um, product dash and dash innovation slash detect and so on and so forth. Yeah, it so, it, so the thing is, it doesn't show the spec sheet. I want to see the spec sheet. It's more of like a media um, media um, description. I wanted to see the actual tech sheet for it. Okay, and then we have one from Hill Bundok. Uh, the muted immune response is surprising. Do we know which type of interferon is effective against this virus? Um, we may need to add that to therapy. Yeah, we don't know at the moment. Um, yeah, maybe interferon one. I mean, even the SARS the first SARS also had some dysregulation. I think there was a report that there was some dysregulation or delayed response by the interferons. Um, this is talking about the first SARS. So for the second, for this COV-2, yeah, people definitely need to still study which interferon it is. Yeah, so there's really so much more. Um... Uh, we need to understand about this uh, particular yeah. virus. And then adding the interferon, yeah, Joel Chua actually asked me this one, like, should we add interferons to therapy? So we have to be very careful, right, with when playing around with interferons, especially for people with underlying um, comorbidities. Okay, I think we've gone through all of the questions. That was really great. And I, yeah, everyone was really interested. Very interesting topic. And you've raised really very relevant questions. Yeah, very um, good questions. Thank you. Yes. Uh, and, okay, so before we close, I just wanted to promote. Okay, so let me just uh, share my... Okay, I don't know. Oh, there we go. Okay, let me just share my screen to promote our next webinar. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so next week, we will still continue on with our SARS-CoV-2. Uh, next week, it's going to be Professor Francis de los Reyes of um, NCSU talking about fate of SARS-CoV-2 in water and wastewater. So we'll begin the webinar at the same time that we do every Friday. And if you want to register, so please uh, visit the link which I've shown you um, right here. Okay, so... Uh, that's it. Um, hmm. Okay, now I don't know how to unshare. My... <laughs> okay, uh, hold on. Yeah, now I don't know how to unshare my link. I think on the top part, at least my computer has this bar on top. Now I can't see. <laughs> It's okay. <laughs> okay, hold on. Okay, there we go. Okay, stop sharing. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, so Anna, any other words? Um, I think let's keep the conversation going about this and it's very it's great to hear um, all these relevant questions and if we can find a way to somehow facilitate collaborations that would be awesome. 
Yes, and um, please don't forget to send me your slides, the PDF version of your slides, and also a copy of this uh, video so we can upload it to the YouTube account 